That's really been the story of the entire week is everybody generously giving of their time to come in and present and just share with the community some of the things that are going on in our lives and the way these really creative people that we are are addressing a need for kids. Because frankly, folks, that's what it's about. It's not about uh, making money. It ain't about making me famous. It's about helping my kids and just trying to do the best I can in the classroom. I also want to thank Ken Bauer for moderating for us. So uh, we'll try to follow his lead. And Ken, I assume you're recording and I assume you've already given your Ken Bauer warning. No, I'm waiting for you to stop. Um, so that's about normal. <laughs> so we are recording. If you don't want to be recorded on the video, um, turn off your camera now. And if you are worried about that first minute or so of recording, um, speak to me in the chat or something and I will go and edit out that first minute before I just wanted to hit the record button before I forget because that has happened once or twice in my life. And uh, now that I've started the recording, ground rules as everyone's coming in, if you want to have your camera on, that's fine and that's helpful for someone to be able to, to watch everyone while we're, while we're giving this presentation, John's work. And uh, just be nice, be good to each other. Uh, please be inclusive. Don't totally dominate the conversation when we're having questions. Please include others in the discussion as much as possible. And I want to thank Matt for all his work, especially and everyone else who's been uh, contributing in this week of fun. And a special thanks from the Flip Learning Network for that. And uh, thank you, John, for coming to us this week and providing this and using this as a, a push to get this video done. And it was an excellent video and I will pass it on to you and I'll mute up. Sure, so yeah, I'll just say thanks. I, uh, it's a video I've been planning to make for a year and a half or something. And when I saw, actually on Sunday, I saw that the Flipped uh, Tech 2020 was happening and it's like, okay, I guess I'll take the opportunity to make the video. So. I wrote the script Monday, filmed Monday, Tuesday, edited Tuesday, and got it out Tuesday. So there you go. Um, so Ken, what's the what's the protocol for asking questions, et cetera? So anybody can throw questions in the chat. We've actually got a lot of moderators here, uh, experienced moderators, so I'm sure they'll help me out. And I'm actually giving them co-host duties so they can help me with all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. Throw questions <clears throat> in chat. You don't need to keep an eye on the chat, John. We'll try to uh, keep an eye on that for you if you don't want to triple task uh, yeah, or you put Billy or Bobby on it and then um, just go ahead and, and answer the questions if someone wants to open up their microphone and just jump in with a question maybe we'll start with a yes no inside the participants window so zoom as a participants window if you open that up and just give John an idea of who watched the pre class video uh, did you watch it yes or no In other words, did you do your homework? <clears throat> did you? Do, well, did, did you do not homework? Uh, before class work. Oh, I'm sorry. That's sure pre work. I don't know. <laughs> what do we call it now, John? I don't, I don't even know. You've been going over this for years. Yeah, but I don't. I don't ever refer to that. <laughs> you don't pay attention to your own stuff. <laughs> no. So we're getting a bunch of greens and some reds in there. All right. <clears throat> and a whole bunch of chats going on, uh, mostly yeses and no. I'm looking for questions. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. So uh, we'll go with, uh, it looks like a mostly, maybe call it asynchronous task. Nice, Elaine. Um, so <laughs> we'll go with, it's mostly yes. So I'll just, we got a couple of no's. I'll, I'll summarize them. That gives me a, a place to go. All right. So I will share screen. We're going to go, I want to go to, there it is. That's me. Woohoo. All right. So, I guess I'll just talk briefly about me in case people don't know. I'm Jonathan Thomas Palmer. I've been teaching high school physics for 20 years. I've taught all sorts of physics, all the way from general physics to AP Physics C, electricity and magnetism. So I've taught a lot of things. Those who are familiar with physics, I've actually never taught AP Physics 1 or 2, but I taught AP Physics B for a while, and that basically covers both of those subjects. Um, all right, here we go. So. Uh, I now have free physics educational videos. I started doing that in 2013. I'm not going to show you those videos. You can find them if you want to, clearly, flipping physics. Uh, I just want to cover some ground rules. Basically, uh, we're here to learn, be supportive of one another. I really want you to ask questions. I don't have a presentation that's going to last for an hour. I, I definitely don't want to do that. Um, so it's a 
pretty brief presentation. And mostly what I want to do is answer your questions because I know uh, I already got a lot from just posting the video. So I will answer questions. I also want other people to answer questions and give suggestions and just be involved. Um, so I will give a brief review rundown of asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning. Uh, asynchronous just simply means that, uh, Helene, just, you know, I'm going to answer this for you. Uh, asynchronous, the way I'm using it here is that uh, the students are not all doing the same thing at the same time. They get to pick their own pace uh, in the class. And I, as the teacher, I'm not directing, saying from day to day what you're going to do. Flipped, hopefully at this point you know what that means, so I'm not even going to cover it. Gameful, uh, there's a subtle distinction between gameful and gamific uh, gamification. Gamification is to take the class and make it into a game. Gameful is to take the rules of a game and apply it to the class. So basically, I'm using rules to identify and set up the way the class is running, but it's not a game in that there aren't people working against one another. And then mastery learning, uh, people need to be able to master the subjects before they can move forward. And I talk about all of that in the video. All right, here we go. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I want to talk for a minute about why I did this. I started flipping my classes in 2013 and it's going to sound funny, but for a long time, I really felt like my class was actually pretty much the same as what had been for a long time, just that the homework was now done at school and the school, the lectures were done at home. Uh, and so I knew that I was going to like, it was going to end up changing my, the way my class was structured tremendously. I just, it took me a long time to get to the point where I, could figure out how. It wasn't until 2018 that I actually started really making changes to my class, which is what I, what I do now with the asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning. And so I, I joined, I found an edX MOOC, a massive open online course from two professors at the University of Michigan. Uh, and I went through this whole uh, MOOC about gameful learning. And I do want to tell you, I'm sorry that they no longer run this course. It is now archived. So you can go and find all of the materials for it. And you can go through the whole course, but you're not going to get quite the interactive experience that I did if you're, if you're interested in doing it. And uh, just to give you a fair warning, I actually started this process about 10 months before I started doing it in class. Uh, and as like, even a month into it, I went to my administration and said, I have this idea of a major change I want to make to my class, but I want to make sure that you guys are going to back me up on it. I don't want to put all this work into this and discover that you, you're like, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Uh, and they, they gave me permission, said, absolutely, we will support you in doing that. So I do recommend if you are even if you're in the planning stages of making a major change to your class, make sure that it's something you're going to be able to do um, and get, get your administration on board. Uh, so I'm not going to go through these two slides, actually. Uh, there's a whole, at gamefulpedagogy.com, they have a whole thing about gameful learning. I actually talked a little bit about it before, but there's this whole thing about self-determination theory, about competence, autonomy, and belongingness, and how gameful learning fits all that. But I don't feel like that's something I really want to get into today. I want to get more into how it works, how it, how it doesn't work, because there, you know, there are going to be issues with anything that you do that is, that is very different. Um, so I, I, I'm going to move forward. Uh, so I want to, I want to answer the question, like, what is this actually like? Uh, for those of you who watched the video, you saw the time lapse of my entire video. Uh, and I'm curious, do people agree? I'm just curious if people agree that it is craziness. So I just want to see, like, give me a thumbs up. Watching my class, the time lapse, does it look remarkably different than a standard class? I want to see this, I want to see this, I want to see, okay, I got Andrew somewhat. So for, for me, I got, okay, that's good. I can, I can handle that. So for me, I've done a lot of, um, 
a lot of viewing of other teachers and it looks very different than a traditional classroom but i think it might not look that different from a standard flip classroom and uh i think that the craziness that you need to understand is that there are so many different things going on at the same time so literally i'm bouncing around from student to student from table to table and answering questions about uh, two different labs and different worksheets and some people are taking quizzes other people are doing other working on a project or all sorts of different things so it is uh, it's craziness from that standpoint uh, and it is important that you, you realize it's not conform to normal teaching so one of the things that I that I had to get my uh, administration on board with was that I have a teaching evaluation right where they're supposed to come in and observe me giving a lesson and the truth is that they don't there's there's no real lesson that they're coming in and seeing me present because every student is working on something different so one of the things i had to do early on as i said is to get uh my administration to be able to say okay your teaching evaluation is going to have to look different uh and that that's something that they were willing to do but just realize it does not fit a normal teacher evaluation uh, and i i want to stress that because of the way that I structure my class and that the first day of the semester, I give the students every assignment that's going to exist for the entire semester, that there is a lot of work beforehand. Um, it, like, as I said, I spent 10 months preparing for that first semester. Um, but it, it also means that there's actually slightly less work during the school year because you are not doing all of the lesson planning and i'll I'll just i'll throw this one out there as well uh snow days i didn't realize this until the first snow day a snow day came up and i was like wait a minute i don't have to figure out how i'm going to change class because the students are going to have to figure out how they are going to change what they're going to do based on the fact that they, they don't have class today, <clears throat> which I thought was awesome. <laughs> Taking that <clears throat> and putting it on the students. Um, so, and, and like this one, this one was actually interesting for some students. Like some students were able to jump on this right away, the idea that they get to decide when to turn in stuff, but every year at the beginning of the school year i have a few students who come to me and they're just like just tell me when to turn everything in um and i i find it interesting that you you give them this autonomy this agency over their own work and some of them don't want it uh but the truth is that i think that especially for me i teach mostly seniors that this is something that this is a skill they need to be able to have they need to be able to make these decisions and have agency over their own work. Um, so it, it was interesting as, as well that it, it changes how grading works. So the, the way grading generally worked in my class is something is due. And so I get a pack of all of these things that I have to grade all at once. So uh, I would have, you know, and generally it was like I would get a quiz and a lab and a worksheet kind of all at once and I'd have to grade all of these things all at once. Uh, and it's no longer like that. Now what it is, is every day some students turn in a few things. So I'm actually grading every day. Um, and it's a lot nicer because it's just consistent and I just grade a little bit every day rather than having to grade a lot every Saturday or, or however, however it works out. Um, and another funny thing that I did not think about is I actually now don't make copies of any assignments except for quizzes and tests because the students are the ones who are deciding when they're going to do something. So, and they have access to all the PDFs for all the assignments. So in class, I'm lucky enough to have a printer in my classroom and students just print out whatever it is when they need it um, and it also saves paper 
because I don't have to guess as to how many assignments I'm going to need. The students just print out what they think they need. Um, I feel like I've talked too much, so I'm going to stop and I'm going to. So we've got some questions rolling in, John. Um, oh. I'll go from the first ones. So Mona asked, which LMS would help me to apply gainful and flipped learning? Is that something you can answer? I don't know what LMS is, so. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. So what I'm tool, sorry. What specific tools help you to do, to make your class gainful? Okay, so um, the MOOC actually came with a gameful LMS, mm -hmm. and I looked at it, and I just thought it was too much. Okay. So for me, I wanted it to, I did not want another thing that my students have to learn, right? So I just have a web page, and it literally lists all of the assignments in order. Yeah. I made it in Weebly. That's all it is. Uh, I will say that there is one major piece that really helps make this work, and that's that I have laptops in my classroom. Mm -hmm. So they are available for the students to use. Um, and that's a really helpful thing because students can come in and they can watch the videos if they need to, or they can pull up the solutions to an assignment or pull up a, a different assignment. So it's not something that I have, but something for my students is really having some sort of um, digital media for them to be able to work with is really, I, I really don't think I could do it without, unfortunately. Okay. What else another, we got? another question from Joanna. So what do you wish you knew about this strategy the first year you tried to implement it regarding growing pains of change in the classroom environment? Okay, it's actually, what's funny about that one is it's the same mistake I made when I flipped my classes for the first time. So the first time I flipped my, which is, uh, of course, I made the same mistake. So I'm going to tell you, so maybe you could not make the mistake. Uh, so I, I get really excited about my new thing. And I flipped every single lecture. Right. And the students, the, the feedback back that I got relatively quickly, which just, which dumbfounded me, was that they still wanted some lecture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you really, you want me to stand at the board and talk? Uh -huh. And the answer is, is yes. And so after I flipped, I... I then took it back a little bit and I identified some key lectures. I was like, okay, I'll do a lecture every two weeks or something, something like that. Just as a, to, it was a grounding moment and, and all of that. It's, and it's and like I, comfort I, food, John, or they're, they're, yeah. they're getting it like they're used to. Yeah. So I actually made the same mistake, which is dumb. When I did uh, asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning for the first time. Uh, Cause I was like, how could I do this if it's asynchronous, right? How can I yeah. give a lecture if all the students aren't at the same point? Well, again, I got the same feedback, which was not only do we want to do some lectures, but we miss having some all class activities. Mm -hmm. So I actually talked to my students quite a bit about it. And what we arrived at was that I would do lectures, a few lectures, and we do a few in-class activities that will provide, they know at this point, they should know this material, right? And I, I, what I figured out is if I'm giving a lecture and you are behind, then this is new for you. And the video that you watch, which was supposed to be the introductory video, is now a review for you. And that's okay. And it worked out for students. And if you are ahead and I'm going over something that is something that you've gone over a, a, a already, it's review and that's okay. Uh, and the same is true for the activities that we would do. Um, and it actually, I, I found it was also helpful because it would give me, it, it gives me a kind of a litmus test of where the whole class is relative to where we should be. Uh, I do get that feedback because I, you know, I wander around and I talk to every student all at once, but uh, it's good to get that feedback kind of 
en masse. That, that's a major mistake I made, which is to, to make too much of a change all at once, I guess. Okay. Andrew, you had a good question about sick days. Did you want to pipe up on that? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Jonathan, you said about snow days when everyone's out, but at some point you're human, you're not going to be in the classroom either. How does that work? Do the, are the students sort of trained, for lack of a better word, to, to sort of run things themselves? Or do you Absolutely. have them doing something else and put it on no, pause? No, 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 no. I didn't it's, think so. It, they, are, they are trained, uh, and they, I mean, actually, I'll, I'll highlight that there's a, there's a piece that, that I found interesting to this, which is part of the training, which is students eventually realized that the start of class is not the start of class, that they are in charge of their own learning. So why would they wait for me to start class? So I have kids who come in and 10 minutes before class, they've already started working on whatever it is because they know this is their time regardless. They, they need to get the work done, right? So I also have kids who will stay after class because they're in the middle of something and they wanna finish it. So the same thing is true for when I'm absent, uh, which, you know, does happen because I'm human, as you said. Um, the, the students know what they need to do. Um, I'm not there to answer questions and there are a few things like I don't have them take quizzes because that's, it, it would be way too stressful for a sub to be in a classroom with all that <laughs> going on and two students over by the side taking a quiz. Um, so I, that's the one thing I, I don't do. Okay. Uh, and there are a couple of labs that we can't do, but, but uh, mostly it's just, it just keeps on rolling. Amanda, you had a good question about uh, students already done the lab. I, I don't know if you want to say that yourself or I can read it. I was just suggesting that if students have already done the lab and another group was doing a lab, they had already completed. So rather than you being there to help them with a the lab, if one group had already done the lab, could they as, I mean, is that a thing that you have as collaboration between groups when you aren't there? Oh, oh yeah. So, I mean, this, this is something that I foster all, all year long, which is like, if, if you come and ask me a question that somebody else has already answered, I will have that student come and answer that question for you. And so this is, this is something that I, I try to train into my students and after a little while, and, and they get excited because they're like, oh, I know the answer to that question. And, and it's, a, it's a coaching thing too. I don't just like abandon them and say, you explain it to them. I, I'm like, okay, let's have you explain it to them. And we talk and I, I'm there for like, this is, this is all at the beginning of the school year. It takes several right. months, but I'm there and I'm, I'm, t I'm helping them figure out how to explain to someone else. So mm -hmm. this is the same thing that, that happens with labs as well, is sometimes if one group has completed the lab and another group is starting to work on it, I will have them discuss it. I've never done it when I've been absent, so that's an interesting idea, um, but it's, it's definitely, something, definitely something that occurs. Okay. And Amanda also asked about, do you worry about consistency of scoring or do you have detailed rubrics to help with that? Uh, okay, yeah, so this is that, that was one of my concerns early on because uh, I try to be really careful to, like I'll, I'll grade all of the quizzes at the same time, right? And I'll actually start on the back so I don't know who's, whose quiz it is. Like, uh, and, and this was one of my concerns early on is if I grade someone's today and then I grade the same thing two weeks from now. So what I have now is I have a folder that has all of my grading rubrics for the entire semester and on there i've done my best to keep detailed notes of how many points people get for what um it, you know and it's not perfect but okay. it, it, it but it's it's i do my do my best to to do that but yeah it, it does take uh detailed detailed notes about how you grade Okay, anyone else wants to jump in while I'm looking for questions, but here we go. Bernard said something back there. And do you have to worry about students sharing quiz info? Ah, good question. Okay, so every quiz that I have has five different versions of the quiz. And so I can have five different students at the same table taking the same topic quiz, right? And they're not like 
this one has different numbers than the other one. There are five different quizzes, and I've just done my best to make them all roughly the same in difficulty and all that stuff. Uh, and, and one of the things we run into here is that I will have student A take the quiz today, and I'll give that quiz back to student A tomorrow, and then I'll have student B take that same quiz a week from now. So my solution to that is I've got five different versions of the quiz. And if somebody studies off of one other quiz, they have a 20% chance that they will have learned the right quiz. And they've now studied off of that quiz. And none of my quizzes are, none of my quizzes are multiple choice. They're not, they're all long form, uh, yeah, they're, they're all like my quizzes are basically two questions and it's all you've got to be able to follow all the steps and, and show all your work and do all that stuff. So my my strategy is to with those five quizzes that I just don't worry about it that much. Um, and, you know, if somebody's going to try to get a hold of all five and study them, they've wasted a lot of their time. Uh, John Nichols asked, what levels do you use this with? Do you have students that don't do all the mandatory assignments? Okay, so. I'll let you drink your water. <laughs> I, uh, I teach at a, uh, a, I don't know how to say this. It's a, it's a different school. Uh, we do not have any AP classes. Uh, we do not do any tracking. We are within a mile walk of the University of Michigan. We have our schedule set up as a block schedule alternating Monday, Tuesday. So that we have Monday, Wednesday classes and Tuesday, Thursday classes and then Friday classes. And the reason we have it set up that way is so that our students can go to the University of Michigan and take classes there. So when I, when I talk about what level I teach, I teach a physics class that has students in it that struggle with algebra all the way through students who are taking third semester calculus at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so the way that I deal with that is that I have both mandatory and optional assignments. And I have some optional assignments that go way beyond the scope of what I would ex expect these students to be able to do. And I have some students who are very excited to do those optional assignments because they're like, this is great. I, 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 I love to struggle through stuff and, and learn this, right? Um, so that, that's how I deal with it, but it's very interesting to have that wide of a range in my class. Uh, there was under uh, some other question in there that I missed. Oh, there's a bunch. So Mona was about, and so we're, I think, being kind of facetious about LMSs. So how, how do you record points for students? What's your recording <laughs> oh, okay. mechanism? Uh, you know what? I, I have a whole slide on that. Let's see. Uh, let me, let real me real quick, the, yeah, the other part of it was, do you have students that don't complete all the mandatory? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew, Thanks, I knew it was there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Um. And the problem is, no matter how hard I try, I cannot do the work for students, right? I, I, I just can't. Uh, I have slightly fewer than I had before I did this. The average grade is higher. I would say the average understanding is also higher, but no matter what I do, I cannot, I can't, right? I can't do the work for students. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, are they just stuck on the first unit until the end of the year? Or is there what, how does that work? That's sort of what I'm wondering about. Uh, oh, so, so what do they do? So, uh, I'm thinking of one right now. Um, so I have a student who got like a 20% in the class. And what I found amazing about that was that student continued to do work that was kind of on pace, but just didn't do enough. And 
I, I was dumbfounded. I, I had many talks with them. I tried to contact parents. I was never able to get parents involved. Um, and on my feedback form this year, I got a lovely note from her saying, I'm sorry I did so badly in your class, but I want you to know that I really feel like I've learned a lot. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was just amazed. Um, let me, I, I think I'm gonna answer some of the questions right here. Let me walk through a little bit more and then we'll get back to more questions. Yep. So uh, one of the things that I, I really love about this is it is efficient with students time. Just one simple example is when a student is done with a quiz test or whatever you want to call it in a normal class, they then have to sit there and wait for every other student to finish such that the quiz is done. In my class, when you are done with the quiz, you turn in the quiz and you move on to the next thing. The only time you are done and there is nothing to do in class is when you are done with the entire school year. Yeah. And I, I have had a couple of students uh, who got done in early April. And I'm like, good, go for it. Focus on and other they, stuff. <laughs> they, they, they actually, they had a, there were two students who had a plan. They were like, uh, we're taking this independent study in filmmaking and we have a film we want to make, but we can't film it until it's warmer out. So we're going to get physics done. And then we're going to work on this film class. Awesome. I was like, absolutely go for it. Um, so for students, it is so much easier to be absent or, or have something else going on every year. Uh, I have the theater kids where in the fall there's that week or two weeks or whatever it is where they cannot get anything done. And with this class, they don't. And it's okay. They know that's going to happen. And they either, they either work ahead and mm -hmm. then get behind or they just get behind. But it, but like, it is so much easier. And I had, I have, I had a student anyway, but it's just much easier. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, this is interesting. So it shakes up lab groups. And this is something I always wanted to do, but it happens organically here because you have one student who's normally in this lab group who, for whatever reason, is behind and they couldn't be in the lab group. So they have to join some other lab group. So it just, it, you have this, it shakes everything up and you get kids working with other kids that wouldn't normally do so. And, and I love it. And, and in fact, I'll tell you this, that when a kid is ready to work on a lab in class, I will stop everyone and I'll say, okay, who's ready to take data on this lab today? And we'll get a couple kids over here, a couple kids over there. And I will just put them all together and say, okay, now, now we have a lab group, uh, which is, is awesome because for years, it was like the same kids in the same lab group for every lab. Yeah. And it always bothered me. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it's so atypical for me, like as a teacher, like I'm not, com anyway, I, I don't need to talk about it. So I talked about that, some students starting. It's easier to make up absence. Okay, so I do wanna talk about this um starting with zero uh, well right right the fact that everybody starts with zero actually i'm gonna have a whole bunch to talk about this okay so everybody starts with zero so everybody starts out failing and once they get over the fact that they have a zero in the class and the parents get over the fact that they're all failing it's fine and their grade always goes up i was listening to a podcast a couple days ago made for teens by teens and they were talking about the stress of school and how if you fail one test, you know, your grade is tanked, you can't go to college, so on and so forth. Yep. In with this structure, you can fit. I had a kid last year who could not pass a test on the first try. And it wasn't that they didn't understand what was going on. They could just could not pass tests. And this is evidently something they've been going through their whole life. But with my class, it did not matter because mm -hmm. you, you fail the test. So now you have to do quiz corrections and quiz corrections mean you talk to me, we walk our way through it. And now you understand it. Um, so it is a lot less stressful. Mm -hmm. And 
no matter how badly you do on any assignment, you can always do more assignments to get more points to get to whatever grade you want. And your grade is always going up. So it's a lot stressful, a lot less stressful for students. But this fact that cur current grade is difficult to report, I'm gonna show, where'd it go? Oh, I lost it, uh, it is this one. Um, I'm gonna show this. So this is something, <laughs> it's funny how sometimes you have to go old school in order to do what you want. With the grading, the grade book that I'm forced to use with my school district, it does not work with, with gameful learning at all. Everybody starting with a zero just doesn't work. I'm required to put all the grades in there, so I put all the grades in there. But every week, every weekend, I post this. Every student has a code, and this is their total number of points that they have so far. Over here are the weekly mandatory points. And you could see that I've estimated how many mandatory points they should have had at this point at in point. the semester. And this is the current week, we're on week 17, and you should have 79, 797 mandatory points, which gets you to this 797 points, gets you to the A minus, yeah. right? So I report every weekend where they currently are, what their current grade is. But this is so different than a grade in a normal class because this is just a reflection of where you are relative to what it's we a, would a consider. It's a snapshot in time. Right, but you could, everything's gonna get better. Your grade's going to get better from here. So technically um, these can go down then, John, because these are relative according to the recommended. Right, uh, the, 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 number of, the number of points will not go down. But yeah, right. so if, next, if you don't do anything this week, this week the, the number of mandatory points are going to go up. The expectation goes up, so right. your percentage goes the, up. The okay. expectation goes up. So I had uh, several people ask me via Facebook and YouTube and stuff, how do you deal with colleges and sports and things like that? If, if the sports people look at the grade and they're failing, you know, they, they can't yeah. play the sport. So this is where I point everybody. I'm like, this is what their grade currently is. Yeah. Um, and I, I have students give t the, uh, the coaches my name and email. And every year I get a couple of emails saying, I don't understand what's going on. And I just, I have a, I have a form that I send to those people and this is what's going on. And, you know, um, but uh, yeah, the, the current grade is difficult to work with. Uh, and I actually honestly kind of like that the students, don't, I, that, don't. that it's so different and they're, they're, while they can look at this and they know how many points they have, like it's not as clear cut, even though it completely is, it's just a number, number of points right. out of how many, many points total. Um, but I find that they end up being less concerned about what grade they have. Honestly, because right. it's it's just because it's so different. It's conditioned. Right. It's yeah. similar right, to what I remember you talking about this on our podcast, John, and this is yeah. similar What's to up? how I do it. It's shots in time. So a whole bunch of questions here. Um, let me try to throw them out. So okay. uh, you answered the thing about the points. So how large is your typical class roster? That's a fast one. Uh, Thank 20, you. Uh, 26, 28. Okay. And Matthew drops the bomb with how well did this survive the COVID transition to remote learning? <sighs> Sorry. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, so I, I don't know about you, but I've been, a, I've been avoiding emotionally and mentally what's going to happen in the fall. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so I will say that as far as transition to online learning, this was relatively easy. Uh, it was the hardest part was simply motivation for students. Uh, and that was my, I don't know how other school districts did it, but my school district changed it. So everything was pass fail and you only had to pass a certain number of assignments. And like, eh, you know, I had kids who they had to pass 10 out of 18 assignments and like they got to 10 and they were done. And I can't blame them. I mean, as I said, I have mostly seniors. So I had seniors who were going through COVID-19. Um, but I, I guess I will say 
it did work really well. No, I'll rephrase. I think it worked well relative to many other ways class would work. Because, I mean, all I did was basically say, okay, we're doing the same thing. Now I am available through Google Meet and you come and you ask me questions there. Okay. Now that was the easy question. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, that was the easy question. Because I, I think a lot of flippers found that the transition this time, again, I think the way you phrased it was great. It worked as well or better than other methods would have worked in a similar situation. And you're right. Emotionally, I'm a little scared. How do we start next year? How do you think this is going to survive the start of next year? That's the hard question. Right, because I have to get parents and teachers on board to asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning this way. Um, and it's a concern I have, uh, but I'm, I refuse to go back. I, this is so much better than what it was before. Mm -hmm. I now have this fancy video that I can show people about what asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning is. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ken, um, and Matt. I didn't do nothing, but. <laughs> well, you provided the, the opportunity. Yes. Um, so I, I've ha I actually had a student make a suggestion, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it was based off of the time lapse of watching me run around the classroom all day, which is I need to think about how I structure my online learning with students, not yeah. with me as the focus of what's going on, but with students as the focus of what's going on. Right. So I think what I'm going to end up doing is having students set up, uh, I don't know, I don't even know what we're using next year. I, our school districts has given us zero information yet. Um, but I will have my students set up, for example, they're setting up a Google Meet and they share the link with me. And I'm gonna organize them by topics that they're working on so that I will hop back and forth and hop back and forth and I'm going to have people contact me somehow to let me know we have a question I want to come over here so basically I'm going to need to virtually go around from place to place and I'm going to have to figure out a way to get people on board at the beginning um, and luck I think luckily for me I I've been doing it for two years so like I, I, you know, my, the students at my school already know that I'm a crazy teacher. Uh, they just don't know exactly how it works yet. And I'm thinking, John, that it's, it's not the, the online that changes it. And the hard part is the physical labs <clears throat> configuration as far as I can see. I'm, I'm teaching computer science. I don't have this problem. And breakout rooms yeah. are great. And, and I've been thinking about this, I coined, uh, uh, on-demand synchronous where students tell me when they need me um, during the day um, and, and that's right. my thoughts on doing this and then someone else just suggested zoom breakout rooms Lisa that the, they can be in a breakout room and they go you know they click the button that says John come to our breakout room or whatever right tool you're yeah doing. actually that's a question I had I don't use zoom a lot of right. you as a facilitator can you hop back and forth from breakout room yes to breakout room? I can break okay, so that's Okay, so that's probably what I'll- And they can doing. tell you, they say, John, you're being requested in room two and room three and room six and room seven. Okay. Cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Uh, I, I'm curious, are other people, my school district has actually forbidden us from using Zoom. Um, are other school districts doing that? Yes, no? Yeah. I've seen um, it happen. It's an overreaction to security. As a security professor, I, it's no less secure. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you, it's, but it's just, it, it's politics and choosing and branding and et cetera. Yeah. Fair enough. So uh, it's the age of your students too. Okay. Yeah. But I did a carte blanche, carte blanche for all of the entire right. school district. Right. So. Any, any recorded online session has security issues, but we won't go down that path. But um, the whole bunch I of hope we, I hope we don't questions. go down that path. I hope we don't gotta go down that path right now. Right. Um, do you teach the same course? So Andrea had an excellent question. Do you and many excellent questions? Do you teach the same course as another teacher who doesn't follow the same structure as you and consistency between sections, which I always deal with? Uh, I am lucky enough to say that I do not. 
Uh, and that would be a very difficult thing to work with because I have Awkward. in the past when I flipped, when I at a different school, when I was flipped and there was another teacher that was not, it's just difficult to deal with. Um, and I, I guess what I, where I'll go with that is that anything you do that is going to be different is going to have some issues. Um, and I would personally would much rather figure out how to deal with those issues than not do what is better for students learning, honestly. What else we got? I was muted up while I was typing. Um, so Christy said, I'd like to offer physics C level work to enrich my strong app as students, but I've never taught it and have long since forgotten the calculus I've learned. What is a good resource to provide such enrichment in my classroom? And a bunch of people pointed her to your videos, but any other? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I really, my, I, I have every single one of my lectures that I gave in AP Physics C Mechanics and Electricity and Magnetism, along with lecture notes, and I cover all the math that needs to be done. I guess uh, the one thing that I will, if we're going to get specific with AP Physics C, uh, is I avoid doing any integrals until we get to work and energy, uh, because you you're you don't want to be teaching integrals to your students you want to you want to give them a lot of time to learn in their calc class um although i, I actually end up having to teach integrals in a, in a very basic sense but um you want to give them a lot more time that's the one thing i'll say but i don't want to get too much into physics specific stuff okay um also andrea was talking about the deal with um having to report like mid-year grades to the universities so they had a measurement how the students are doing and how that affects i kind of answered that with your expected mark system and yeah, actually, yeah the students that's... could game it and say well the date is this date so i'm just going to power way ahead in john's class so they have like a super awesome grade and then i can like lean back later i mean they could they could game the system like any system okay i'm gonna or those college that, grades that, 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 I'm, I'm going to argue that it's not gaming the system. It's just getting ahead. And exactly. I mean, but what, whatever. <laughs> but any system can be gamed. Yeah. John, while yeah. Ken is looking for another question, kind of going with comparing your system that you're using, the gamified mastery, et cetera, to even your previous flip system. But did changing the classroom format changed the relational tenor of your classroom, like the relationships Absolutely. with kids. Yes. So I went flip, flipping my classes was one level of having more interaction with my students, but sw switching to this just like uh, it forces me into a situation where every class period I check in with every student because I want to know what are you working on? What, what's your plan? Uh, wh why are you so far behind? You know, whatever, whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and I just end up, there, there's more, it's more relaxed. I, I don't know how else to say it. Like it's just mm -hmm. be, because, because there aren't any due dates and because quizzes are, not as stressful just everything is just a little bit more relaxed so because of that i i do feel there's a, a little more just i feel closer to my students i guess is what i'll say so w would it be fair to say that the students still have the feeling of importance but they don't necessarily fight the worry of immediacy because everything is kind of out there to be had at some point mm -hmm. absolutely Good point Absolutely. from Joanna here, um, if I can interrupt. So do you give yeah. students a recommended due date or pace guiding to help them from getting too far behind? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have uh, in the in the grade book, I have I put at the very beginning of the semester every grade and the the only way I can put it in there is with a due date. So it's listed as a due date. But I point out that those are suggested due dates at the very beginning of the semester on the website. I have a uh, suggested finish date for every level. I also have, anytime we do something in class, I put that as a date 
relative to where everything else is. So there are all sorts of markers for the students for them to know where they should be, what they should have learned by whatever point. Um, yeah, and, and actually getting back to, I did not do that well enough when I first started started this. Uh, and that's something I learned is that I, they really need to know exactly where they need to be. Um, yeah. And then uh, Christy came up, I'm sorry to bring up COVID again, but we're going back face to face. I've been stressing about if I could do lab safely. Um, I think something like this, what you're doing, uh, where students are pacing themselves might allow fewer and smaller lab groups working at one time and giving mm -hmm. them time to sanitize equipment between uses, et cetera. Right, an interesting uh, byproduct of this is I need less lab equipment because you don't have seven groups all working on the same thing at the same time. So yeah, so uh, there are, I actually added one lab because I only have one setup for this lab. I used right. to do it as a demonstration, but I changed it to a lab because now it's, yeah, it, it actually only takes like 15 minutes to take the data, but it's a really useful lab for them to do. Um, and so I think given that, like just the fact that there's less, fewer lab materials that you physically have to use, you have less to clean. Uh, and I think that It'll, it'll work out better in the long run. Mm -hmm. Good. I think I got caught up on questions as well. So anyone Sweet. have something I missed or want to jump in? While people are thinking, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I do <laughs> want to notice that Gilbert is next on the agenda. And thankfully, Gilbert and Joy, the moderator, have given everybody a built-in potty break. Uh, because Gilbert is only going unt until 540. He'll, be, he'll only go into the 40 minute after mark. So for, for some of us that have been uh, doing this marathon today, looking forward to that 20 minutes. So, but do log in and check with them. Uh, we have a great session with Gilbert coming up. I cannot stress strongly enough the Michael Ralph um, session at the end he worked for KU now works for places that build schools and want to talk about putting research into the classroom that's that's the title of that and then of course we have the closing wrap up at the end with some of the folks you see here so thank you so much Thanks, uh, somebody asked somebody asked about points so uh, this is a handout I give day one and so it's just like this is how I structure my class with points so every video lesson is worth two points. Um, and I wanna point out that optional points and mandatory points are the same, they're just points. So there's no like extra credit points or anything like that. They're just either you have to do these points or you don't. So every video lesson is worth two points. And I do not grade like if their lecture notes are correct or anything like that, I just grade have you watched the video and do you have right. lecture notes? Oh, I see you. Whether it's, mm -hmm. I, I don't care. It's just, did you watch it? So every level has a group of optional practice problems. These would have been homework problems before. They're now practice problems. And it, you do, I do not have any mandatory practice problems. Um, and so, and I, for a while it was, you could do as many as you wanted and each one was worth one point, but it got to be so annoying at grading mm -hmm. that I now have a minimum of 10 per level and you could turn in 10 or more. Cause it was just like, I'd have kids turning in two practice problems and like, ah, so um, just from a grading standpoint, that's why I did that. Um, I have, for every level, I have a mandatory and an optional worksheet. Uh, and each are worth six points. And, oh, and I, I want to point out that for all of these, for practice problems and worksheets, I don't grade everything that's there. I pick out a couple of problems and I grade those. Um, and I will also point out that I provide all the solutions to everything in my class with the exception of labs, projects, and quizzes. So every practice problem, every worksheet and I have a practice quiz for every quiz and they have those solutions to them. And 
for the people who are going to be concerned that students are just going to copy down my solutions, they learn early on that if they just copy down the solutions, they're not learning and they are going to flat out fail the quiz. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't do them any good in the long term. They're going to have to learn it anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a useful thing to, to learn. And then oh, I have the practice quizzes worth six points. And then I have labs and projects which run uh, between 25 and 75 points, depending on, and then all quizzes are worth 25 points. So somebody asked about, about points, so I thought I'd, I'd throw that up there. And, and related to that, John, uh, actually not related. So without multiple cho choice questions on quizzes, do you worry about them and their preparation for AP tests? Ah, so if you recall, I do not teach any right. AP classes. I thought that was your answer, but. So, so but I, I will answer the question. So when I taught AP Physics C mechanics and electricity and magnetism, I had multiple choice questions on my tests because you have to. Get them uh, used to it. I, I, I am not a fan of those, but you, you, you have to. That's their reality. They, they have to. So. Yeah, that's, that's the reality. Uh, and I had all sorts of free response questions. I try to have them do all sorts of free response questions uh, throughout the year because I've got to get used to those as well. Helene had something excellent here, so I'll read off quickly. So John, you see for each student, uh, you see for each student what problems, questions they miss. If you see a pattern in the class, do you tweak the course to focus more on that concept? So does assessment inform future instruction? So assessment informs future instruction, not in a change in the assignments that are given, but more in the attention given to a student and what it is that we need to talk our way through. Uh, I do make changes semester to semester, but because of the class structure- And you lay it all out at the front, so. And I, and I lay it out all the front. So at the, the, because of the class structure, um, I do, I, it, that's a very difficult one to like make changes like that. Although I will point out that when I find mistakes on my handouts, I can fix them and change them on the PDF so it's a, it gets live fixed for the next right. student who's gonna use it. Lovely. Uh, but, but really, uh, it, the only way it informs the change to how the class is run is really more my interaction with, with the students and yep. what I might suggest that they work on and things like that. And Joanna asked, answer keys, how do you release them without hurting the honesty of their... Uh, Honestly, so I don't release answer keys for quizzes or labs or projects or anything like that. So all the answer keys are available for the worksheets and practice problems uh, and practice quizzes. Um, and as I said, I mean, if kids want to just copy everything down, number one, I can tell because they can't copy well. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and number two, it, it's not useful in the long run. And, and I, I know which kids are doing it. So you just it, put it, it on it, the site next to the... Yeah, it, it, the, the assignment's right there, and then There's the solutions are the There's one place to go next for thing. everything. One place for everything. Uh, and, and yeah, it, so it's happened a couple of times, and it really becomes more of a discussion piece with the student, uh, because, like, you could say they're cheating, and I guess they are, but, like, I'm putting the solutions there, so I'm not going to accuse them of cheating. I'm just going to have a conversation with them about how they're not learning which they're, they're, they're cheating themselves really in the long run. So great question from Andrea. So I, I suffer with this as well, because you try to lay everything out at the be beginning. So everyone knows what's going to happen for the year or the semester. And then, so how flexible are, are you with, oh, that's a cool idea for an assignment. Let's do that next week. Uh, can you add future assignments for the current class? Or do you uh, so I, so I guess I'll, I, so I've, <laughs> so the way I've done things like that is that I can make optional assignments. Right, so I can add optional assignments. Cool. And I have on a, an occasion removed an assignment and replaced an assignment. Cool. Uh, but I don't want to change the total number of points. We should wrap up. But, We're up on time. Yeah. Matt. Matt's giving yeah. me a bad signal. I, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's how I'll. What well, we that. nailed through all these. And, and I thank you so much. And, and I'm really happy with everyone who participated. Um, John and I talked last night about how to run this, and we really wanted interactive. And I think it always takes a little bit to warm us up and then it got like going. And, and thank you so yeah. much, John. Thank you everyone else that participated. We have more sessions and this is, it's the last day of Flip Tech 2020. I'm gonna miss and it. Andrew mentioned that the next session is a Twitter chat. So, you know, potty breaks for everybody. One out. <laughs> so, but, but, uh, 
Because <laughs> let's be honest, how many times does this go to the restroom a day? So, all right, with that, <laughs> you know, with that, we're, we're, a, we're an informal family group here. Uh, right. We have Gilbert next, and then we have Mike Ralph, and then we're back for the closing. Uh, and Ken, you're in charge of that, right? Because I, I delegated and I feel good about that, right? Yeah, I will share the Zoom session with Wonderful. us, and then I'm going to um, um, decide if it's just Zoom or I'm going to broadcast out to YouTube. We'll figure it out. <laughs> you do what you, you do, you man. Thanks, John. We appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. This was great. I love having an opportunity to just talk about what I do. So it's great. Thank and you. thank you for all our participants. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day. And I will hit the stop recording button. Thanks, Ken.